My family is getting ready to go on the great American road trip with our Tesla Model Y. This is a 2023 standard range Model Y. So the range of the 100% battery is 279 miles. And as I detailed in some of my other videos, that range is not interstate range, highway range. That is a, a more of a city range because EVs do better in city. So it's a little bit flipped from conventional thinking and gas powered vehicles that do better on the highway for mileage. Regardless, rear world interstate range is probably more in the 260 some mile range, so not a huge hit. But regardless of range, even if it were 500 miles, we're gonna have to charge on the way out there. We are in central Wisconsin. We're heading out to Yellowstone, which is about 2,000 miles. So we need to put in our plan charging. In our day-to-day -day lives, using the Tesla Model Y, charging is a non-issue because we do it at home every night and then don't think about it. But the road trip is obviously different and it's one of the main reasons that keeps people from buying electric vehicles. So I'm gonna bring you along with and let you know exactly how much it costs and how much time we lose on it and if we have any problems. So there is a little bit of extra planning that we had to do preparing for this trip. Good news is the Tesla app or in the car, the, the map feature is, is really easy. If you put in your destination, it will tell exactly where you need to go and, and superchargers you need to stop at and how long you need to charge at each supercharger. It's a little more convenient doing it on the phone because you don't have to be in the car. You can be in bed playing around with it. Then you can send that to the car. But regardless, um, it did help us choose our hotel stay locations um, and the biggest change it made is we're on the east side of Yellowstone, so um, it would make sense maybe to go in the east entrance. But because there are no big cities or the infrastructure is, is pretty minimal on the east side because you have to go through the Bighorn Mountains and it's just, uh, there's really no interstates running to the east side, there's nowhere to charge. So we're gonna go up and around and go in the west entrance. So that was a, a relatively major change, but. Then you're on interstates more, the, the drive isn't as scenic, I don't think, but um, it allows use of the EV. And then within Yellowstone, there's actually a bunch of EV chargers within the park. But um, we picked our hotel locations where there's a Tesla supercharger nearby so we can make sure uh, before we go on adventures for the, for the day, we're, we're completely charged up. Now the one thing, EVs um, are eventually gonna take over pretty much all combustion vehicles, in my opinion. Uh, even without the environmental aspect, we, which you can debate, they're just a better powertrain. They need less maintenance, they're more powerful, and it's a better driving experience. And no shifting of the transmission, just a simpler vehicle. And with incremental battery improvements, they're only gonna get better. Um, but right now, the majority of electric vehicles are very hamstrung by the charging infrastructure. Tesla's deal with Ford and some of the others are gonna help that, but by far, um, Tesla has the most chargers out there and, and they work. Um, so within the app, it's pretty darn cool. It tells you what charger to stop at and for how long. So the majority of our stops are between 10 and 20 minutes, so it's not that long. Also, along the whole route, we're not having to divert to get to a charger. Along the major interstates that go out there, there's Tesla superchargers spaced out perfectly to accommodate the range of this vehicle. So, not only with Tesla are you buying the car and this product itself, you're buying access to that entire charging network. They are slowly opening it up for other auto manufacturers, but if you look at the fine print in there, it's not every charger, it's a small subset of the available chargers. So uh, to me, that, that's a no-go for anything other than the Tesla, um, the charging network. That'll change in a few years um, as it's built out, but that's where it's at right now. One thing that's very pleasantly surprising on the Model Y is the amount of interior space that you get. Even the Model 3 is quite voluminous trunk. For the exterior size of the vehicle, Tesla did a really good job of maximizing interior space 
with the amount of overall dimensions that they put in their vehicles. And one of the big ones is below the, the back here, we have a pretty good sized trunk that we can fit luggage in below. But you may pick up like a lot of modern vehicles, there's not a spare tire in here. So you're give and take there. Now you could debate the logic of that, but to be honest, in my, oh, math is hard, 20, 20 plus years of driving vehicles, I've had to change a tire once on the interstate. Um, I've tried fix the flats before, not in emergency situations. Those don't work good at all at, at fixing a leak. They're good at infl inflating the tire, uh, but not plugging the leak. So what I found works quite well is these uh, tire repair kits. So this is radial string inserts along with a couple tools. So you actually, these strips of, of gummy rubber, you jam into the hole within the tire. So as long as it's in the tread area, in an emergency situation, I suppose even in the sidewall, just to inflate a little bit to get yourself off. The interstate, you could use that. So this does not come with the car. I'm bringing this along with, and then I'll get a, a can of Fix-A-Flat, not to in hopes of plugging the leak, but that'll just help inflate it. The other thing is, this car is a 2023, less than 10,000 miles. It's under warranty up to 50,000 miles, and as part of that standard warranty is roadside assistance. So right on the app, you can call for a tow truck or a help um, to get you somewhere to they'll tow the car, put it on a flatbed most likely, um, and get you a new tire or repair the tire. So that's uh, awesome going where we're going, sitting on the side of the interstate for a while. If I have to use it, it's good to know it's there, but I'd like to be able to, if I can find a hole and it's there, replace it or uh, plug it quickly and, and get off the interstate and get somewhere safer. So that's kind of the name of the game, not only with Tesla, just with ever, every auto manufacturer right now, the number of them, including spare tires and vehicles is less and less. So I'm gonna bring this little plug kit and a can of fix and flat, um, just in case. Hopefully you don't need it. One more thing on the range, interstate range, as I said, does not equal sticker range. But the good news is when you're planning your trip, the, the car knows that and it takes into account speed limit of the roads you're gonna be traveling on, uh, elevation changes, weather, even wind, to calculate when you're going to need to stop. So it's very unlikely you're going to get in a position where, where it says you're gonna get there with 10% of battery and oh my gosh, I'm on 1% and I'm gonna make it. From my experience so far, the car has been extremely good at predicting what your battery level is going to be at when you reach that next charging station. The other thing it does is preconditions your battery, so in most cases warms it up and gets it ready to charge as fast as possible once you reach that charging location as it, as it knows when it's going to occur. I'm not gonna do a lot of filming because it's a family vacation. I just wanna be in vacation mode. But I am gonna keep track of predicted percentage, what we actually uh, arrive there at and how long, it takes us, how long it takes us to charge and what it costs. So the good thing about the Tesla Charger Network and the app, you know exactly what you're gonna pay right from the app. So I can look up Bismarck, North Dakota. There's a Tesla supercharger there. It is 36 cents per kilowatt hour. So that's uh, about three times what I pay to charge at home, but it's still not bad. And there are currently eight of eight stalls available. And it tells you when it gets busy to avoid those times or not. My experience again, um, I've never had been to a supercharger that station that had everything full and I had to wait. So we'll also document that if we have to wait at all. Excited, never been out to Yellowstone, see one of America's great national parks and do it in the EV. I'm a little bit excited for this, that the first time I'm, we're actually gonna use the frunk for anything meaningful. Um, so I've got, the Tesla mobile charger, which purchased with the vehicle. 
kind of essential for a road trip like this. There are superchargers along the way, but just in case our hotel has an outlet or something like that, or the cabins we stay at, get some extra charge there. Along with the JS to Tesla adapter. Um, so on our home charger needs this, and this is getting better as more and more companies and places adopt the Tesla charging standard for North America. Um, but anyway, uh, I did a little research and looked at the EV chargers within Yellowstone National Park and they are the JS type. So we'll need this if we're gonna charge in the park. I thought that might be quite convenient. I don't think we're going to have to, but anywhere we can pick up a little extra charge may be worth it. And if we're going to hike or something like that, might as well plug the car in if there's one there. So apparently there's some by Old Faithful, so we'll see. The other thing got the can to fix a flat. And then I've got my little tire repair kit with the rubber strips, and I've got some rubber cement in there ready to go in case we need that. Again, the fix a flat can, I'm not expecting that to fix a flat at all, but that's kind of an easy way to inflate the tire after I put a plug in it. Otherwise, I think we're good to go. We pulled up to our first supercharging stop with 17% battery, exactly what was predicted. And interestingly enough, while we were driving, it recalculated the route and has us stopping one less time but charging longer so we'll see how that goes we are at the second charging stop with 24 percent which is quite a bit more than it predicted so our time here charging time went down from an hour to 50 minutes Stop number two. We're cruising on 94 West and something interesting just happened. It was telling us to stop in Fargo, North Dakota for our next supercharging stop. But the projected went from about 15% down to 6% and then went below or to 5%. And at that point it triggers it to reroute us. So it has a stopping sooner in Alexandria, Minnesota. Um, but that's cool that there's definitely a lot of options for superchargers and it just on the fly gives you the best route for time and it doesn't, it's not like forcing us to go off the interstate or anything, it's just uh, stopping at a different one a little bit sooner. But we just hit massive construction and had to slow down quite a bit. So I'm curious to see if our um, projection might get us to Fargo now. Going 75 does suck a lot more juice than cruising at 60, so we'll see if that changes. We made it to Alexandria, didn't change again. Uh, going 75 on the interstate reduced the range pretty good. But there's chargers here. We're at a target and looks like it wants us to charge for 45 minutes. Interesting, as soon as we plugged in, it went from 45 minutes down to 30 minutes. So we'll see how long this charge actually takes. The other ones have been pretty consistent with the estimated charge time. All right, charging is just winding up. We started just before two o'clock, so it's been about a little over 40 minutes. And it says we've got two minutes left. It's charging us up almost to 100% to get to Fargo. We'll see if we can get there, or actually, past Fargo, sorry, past Fargo to Jamestown. And then that's the last stop before a hotel in Bismarck. We'll see if that really happens. All right, we ended up stopping in Fargo and it says charge five minutes. If we didn't charge, we'd get to Jamestown at zero. So it, it's close, but we had to stop here for a quick charge, but it's time to eat dinner anyway. So there's a McDonald's right there. Just walk across the parking lot and get some food. We are at the last charging station, Jamestown, North Dakota. It says 
charge for 10 minutes and continue on. So we did have to do five like the original estimate. Um, but we've had to do bathroom breaks almost every time anyway. So we'll get charged up and get to the hotel. All right, we just made it to Bismarck with 12%. It projected 9%. Pretty nice evening in Bismarck, North Dakota. The reason we ended up here with a little bit more charge than predicted is because I drove the speed limit, which just so happens to be 75 miles an hour, so not real slow. Um, but it was predicting 9%, so I wanted to make sure we'd get here with a little buffer. And we actually got here with more, 12%. And I already dropped the family off at the hotel. They're having fun swimming. I'm here at the supercharger, getting charged up so we can take off right away in the morning. Interestingly enough, at about 15% battery, it's going down already, but this is the fastest charge rate I've had. It was close to 150 kilowatt, but it's steadily dropping. Doing a road trip like this really makes you think about the pros and cons of the electric vehicle and what makes the road trip easier. And really it's not so much total range. If you've got 300 miles total range, I think that's pretty good. What makes it easier is the availability of chargers or charger locations. So you can adapt if you've got a headwind, uh, if you're pulling more charge than you planned on. And then once you're hooked up, the speed of charging. And I think right now that's a limitation, but that is one thing I know electrical vehicle manufacturers and battery manufacturers can improve on incrementally. I think there's some storage limitations, but going to higher voltage batteries, systems, and things like that will help charge. Now, whether or not that long-term is good for the battery or not, that remains to be seen. Work needs to be done on that also. Um, but that's the biggest help for road tripping. I think more range is always better, but you know, this 280, 330, uh, Tesla's figured out that's a good range. Most people stop in that time frame, anyways. Um, so if you can just focus on the charging network, which Tesla, it's already there. Um, as more vehicles are on the road, obviously they need, they're going to continue to need to add stalls. But they've got the locations nailed already. So, um, and the charging speed isn't bad, but it could be better. And that would make life even easier uh, on a road trip. So I could get this done faster and get back to the hotel and swim with the family. Started day two, we're at another Tesla supercharger. We're in Dickinson, North Dakota, about an hour and a half down the road, starting off. And between this and the next supercharger stop, we're gonna stop at uh, Teddy Roosevelt National Park. Hopefully see some animals, it's a little rainy today, but uh, hopefully it clears up a bit. Anyway, um, the Tesla navigation and planning is very good and it's been solid for making sure we get to chargers and not run out of charge. The one thing it's not the greatest at, so this national park, we can add it as a stop, but it doesn't account for two or three hours of driving around the park, right? Um, the good news is the loop mileage wise isn't that long and that's one of the things electric vehicles excel at is slow speed going through a park or something like that. So we're gonna do our own little mental math here, stay here a little longer, charge up, um, maybe 90% or something like that, to make sure we have a, a good buffer so we can spend time at the park and then make it to the next charging station. We are cruising through Theodore Roosevelt National Park and what's helped is to keep our final destination on, even though it's giving us kind of annoying reminders to turn and such but what it is doing is allow us to keep track of the percentage that we're going to have at the next supercharging station and give you peace of mind that you're not going to get stranded driving around the park so we looks like we're going to have 31 percent when we make it through uh, the park and back to the next supercharging station which gives us a pretty good buffer to do pretty much whatever we want within the park here and, and 
No, we're not going to get stranded without charge. By the way, this is uh, quite a pretty national park. We made it to the Cabin Villages last night in Island Park, Idaho. Just about 15 minutes outside the park entrance. So that should work out pretty good. This cabin is kind of a neat thing. Uh, the kids love it and it's super clean and uh, in great condition. So it's awesome. Price is down a little bit from staying right in West Yellowstone too. Check these out if you're interested. But anyway, man, that was a long haul the last two days. Now we can slow down and enjoy the parks, things in this area. The car is doing great. Made it here uh, with a charge in Bozeman. About 30%, so we've got plenty to get to West Yellowstone. There's superchargers there. We'll charge up before we get into the park. And that should be plenty for the, the day to, to slowly cruise around the park. And even within the park, I believe there's EV chargers, so we'll check that out today, too. All right, we spent about five hours driving around Yellowstone. And we charged up to 100%. Before we came into the park and we're down to 69% so we've used about 30% so not gonna have to charge in the park we're at the at the Teton Valley Resort now and I'm in the RV park oh wait we got to see this nice sunset so on the edge of Idaho Anyway, I'm in the RV park because they don't have a dedicated EV charging, but they've got open RV spots and they said, hey, there's a 50 amp uh, socket you can use. So I'm gonna see, is this a NEMA 14-50 that I can use and uh, charge up over the night. So that would be awesome. We're staying in a little log cabin again, um, but let's check this out. Ooh, there it is. It does have a NEMA 1450, so we should be good. So that was super quick. Had the NEMA 1450, 50 amp. Got the mobile charger, plugged it in, and uh, we're rocking and rolling. We just drove 10 miles into the Wyoming wilderness on this dirt and gravel road to get to some hot springs, which were pretty cool. Hopefully we don't have any rattles in the Model Y after. We'll see what it can take. Made it out of the wilderness back to our cabin. I'm in the RV park, I got another spot to charge up and there's a little more light today. So I'm gonna show you how easy this is in an RV spot to charge your car. So we've got it plugged in already. This little thing's for water, we don't need that obviously. Um, but also every RV thing will have a little panel like this. And if we flip this cover up, we can see we've got the two outlets and then a breaker here so we had to turn on this 50 amp breaker then just plug in we're about to go over the mountain pass between Idaho and Jackson Wyoming we're starting with 77 percent battery we'll see what we end up with on the other side all right we're starting to climb here it says up to 10 percent grades Power is not a problem though. All right, we made it to the top. 68%, we'll see how much we regenerate coming down. We're already starting to regenerate there. 10% grade, next five miles. Steep grade, sharp curve, stay in low gear. Runaway truck ramp. Be bear aware. Right, we're 
we're almost down back up to 72 percent so we regenerated four percent coming down and we do have a little bit more grade to come down here all right we're fully down into wilson and 72 percent is the fine we're on the way home with the model y and this time we're taking i-90 and it's just an interesting and a little bit frustrating thing here. We just stopped in Sheridan to charge and it said we had enough to move on. 20 miles down the interstate's telling us to go back to Sheridan to finish to charge again so that we can get to the next charging station because uh, it doesn't think we have enough to make it. So what I did is just, I was going 80, I slowed down to 75 here and that should uh, cause things to, to recalculate and we should have enough to make it to the next charging stop. But um, that is a little bit of a learning lesson on this major road trip. The biggest lever you have is speed. So if it's saying you're not going to make it to the next stop, drop down five miles per hour or more and uh, it should make a pretty good difference and you should be able to make it to the next stop. Another thing you can do to make sure uh, Reducing your speed is having an impact is swipe right down in the lower left and it'll tell you your watt hours per mile So that's basically your miles per gallon equivalent in electric and this number should be dropping So if you're making a change like reducing speed you can watch this average number drop as you go on And that tells you you're moving in the right direction And if you want to make a bigger change slow down even further and watch that drop we were at about 404, it's 93 degrees out, we were going 80, so reduced to 75, and it's dropped it to 390 so far, and it keeps going down, so we should be good. We've got our one hour per mile down to 340, it's kind of settled at, but it still wants us to go back to Sheridan, and we're about halfway between Sheridan and Gillette, still just on the Sheridan side, so we'll see. Uh, when it flips here and how many percent it says we will have when we get to Gillette. So it just finally flipped over to Gillette from doubling back and going back to Sheridan where we just charged um, as we reached the halfway point. And it's saying we're going to be there with 11%. So the speed reduction that I've taken is, has made a big difference. It went down to 73 and now averaging 325, 326 watt hours per mile. So uh, we'll get there in plenty of time. But that is a frustrating part. Uh, we were in Sheridan at the supercharger charging, and it said you've got enough charge to, to continue your trip. And then 10 miles down the freeway, it says, oh, wait, go back to Sheridan and charge. Uh, the first time that happened, I freaked out a little bit, didn't know how to handle it. This time I know uh, I was going 80, bring it down to 75, a little bit more to give yourself a little bit of buffer zone, you'll make it. Um, but that's one of the things, the trip planner is pretty good, but it's not perfect. Speed is the biggest lever. If, you're not, if you don't think you're gonna make it somewhere, just drop five, 10 miles per hour and you'll make it. All right, we made it to Gillette with 11% on the battery, so it worked out fine. And there was a construction zone that lasted a few miles that slowed us down to 65. That helped us pick up some range also. So we're here charging. So far, this one's uh, been one of the more consistent. It's 94 degrees out. And we've been averaging 100 kilowatt for quite a bit here. So actually, uh, charging's going pretty well. Just got back from our Great American Road Trip and we have the bugs to prove it. So whenever you do a road trip, kind of reflect on it, things that you could have done to save a little time or do differently. But overall, things went extremely well with this. The Model Y performed exceptionally. We had zero maintenance, mechanical problems at all. No tire issues. Uh, the biggest challenge was just keeping the windshield clean. And it did give me a chance to check out the public charging network because it's something on a daily basis through the 10 months of ownership, really we didn't have much exposure to, maybe used it once a month. Um, 
visiting family or something like that. But on this road trip, we relied exclusively on the Tesla supercharging network. And then uh, for three nights while we stayed in the Teton Valley Resort, thankfully they had a open RV slot where we could plug in and use the mobile charger, which worked quite well. But I will say the Tesla charging network, not only are you getting a car, you're getting access to that network. And to me, um, that's a deal breaker for all the other auto manufacturers at this point. They're gonna catch up, but right now they're not there. There are so many Tesla superchargers and they're spaced out perfectly for the range of the vehicles that we had no issues. We did have those couple instances where the Tesla navigation say, okay, you've got enough charge to move on to your next location and already had that charger picked out. And then once you get on the highway and maybe you're going a little bit faster than the navigation expected you to, it'll say, whoops, you're not gonna have enough to make it turn around. So that was a little bit disconcerting, but now I know you've got the control. Um, you just slow down a bit, give it some time, bring that uh, watt hour per mile usage down, and it will correct itself, and, and you'll make it to the next destination. If you are going to arrive at your next destination below 10%, that's when it starts to recalculate and it, it doesn't um, think it has enough buffer to get you there, but in practicality, the system is is ultra safe. Um, if you follow it exclusively, you're not going to get into trouble. Uh, but to avoid those instances, probably what I would do is spend maybe five extra minutes at the charger after it says, "Hey, you've got enough to move on to your next destination." Just spend a couple extra minutes before you unplug, and then that way you won't run into that instance where it says, "Hey, go backwards and go back to that charger." Um, but overall, like I said, I never had a time where I thought, oh, I'm gonna be stuck on the side of the road because I'm not gonna have charge or I can't make it to a charging station. That never happened. And we were in some relatively remote areas. The other thing this has uh, given me some experience, not on daily use case, but the road trip use case on electric vehicles, what their strengths and weaknesses are. And the absolute strength of this is in the mountains hilly terrain, it has so much power, you feel like you can zip up a mountain pass. You can pass everybody. I don't care what they're driving, unless it's a McLaren or something. Zip right past them. Um, and then on the way down, you don't even need to touch the brakes. The regenerative capability of the motors allows you to cruise down, basically modulate with the accelerator pedal. And then you're recapturing a majority of that energy that you use to, to zip up the mountain. Um, so we had the one case in the, the pass between Victor, Idaho and Jackson, Wyoming. I think it gained back 2% going back down. So net, we only used 2% battery life to go over. An incredible mountain pass, which a gas or diesel vehicle efficiency would be terrible in that. So the other advantage of an EV is kind of low speed, stop and go cruising. Um, exactly what you do in national parks. So we hit up Teddy Roosevelt, we hit up Yellowstone. You can go for five, six hours. You can drive to the park, cruise around at 20, 30 miles an hour, stop, go look at wildlife, whatever. Um, get your pictures at the scenic overlooks. For five or six hours in this thing and you barely use much battery at all because it's just ultra efficient at that use case. So what the electric vehicle isn't ultra efficient at is high speed interstate cruising. So some of those Western states in the United States, the speed limit goes up to 80 miles per hour. And you wanna be able to take advantage of that to, to cut some time off, because this is an incredibly long road trip for us. And so when you're going at 85 miles an hour, your watt hour per mile spikes up significant. And it's not an issue that the electric motor becomes less efficient at that speed or anything. It's, it's simply aerodynamic drag. And aerodynamic drag in the equation, if we look at aerodynamic drag, you can see the V for velocity is squared. So the aerodynamic drag is not linear with increases in speed. It's actually to the power of two. So um, small increases in that velocity have a larger impact on drag. And that's what 
increases our watt hour, hour per mile use, so it is less efficient. So in gas engines, it's the same. There's a happy medium there around 60 miles an hour where they're most efficient, and then you start going faster, um, and the aerodynamic drag takes over and your gas mileage goes down. The faster you go in this, absolutely you're gonna use more watt hours per mile. You're gonna be less efficient. Even though it's not an efficiency of the powertrain itself, it's just a factor, environmental factors that cause that to increase. So charge rates, I do have a little bit of a commentary on that. When automakers <laughs> claim 16 minutes for 400 miles of range, that's, that's all garbage. That's not true. That's the peak charge rate. And after you spend a couple thousand miles recharging uh, and watching that as, as you're waiting, uh, you realize you can only hit that peak for maybe a few seconds when the battery is on the severe low end of its charge. So this car can charge at 250 kilowatt, but in reality, I only saw 170 as a peak when we were down around 10% battery or something like that. And it, it briefly touched it and then came right down and maintained about 100 kilowatt until 30, 40% of the battery. And then it starts slowing down. Once you're up to 80, 90%, it's down to to 50 kilowatt charging and that's pretty slow so to me the real advancement in this recharge technology would be hey if you can charge at 150 kilowatt but you can maintain that until 80 90 percent that would be a huge difference and a reduction and a significant real world reduction in recharge time for these vehicles i'm also happy I'm also happy to report after 20 miles on a relatively unmaintained dirt gravel road, there's no squeaks or creaks. It came through that pretty good. No change in panel gaps that would, assume, that would indicate that there was a structural kind of uh, deformation to the vehicle, so it passed that. Now what you've all probably been waiting for is the cost of the road trip. How much did we spend on electricity and how does that compare to a gasoline vehicle if you're taking that on a road trip. I already covered in detail the monthly cost of ownership of electric vehicle if you're charging at home and it's significantly cheaper than a gasoline or diesel powered vehicle. The Tesla app does a great job of telling how much electrical energy you used and how much that cost. So it's pretty easy to see on superchargers this month we spent $347 um, and that's the entire cost of fuel or energy for the road trip is $347 that we spent at supercharger stations. So we charge exclusively on the Tesla network except for the three nights that we stayed at the Teton Valley Resort where I was able to get basically free electricity. It was included in the cost of the rental, renting the cabin I was able to charge at the RV spots. But we, so it's not fair to do the overall trip. We've got some free charging in there. So what I'm gonna do is just look at from home to Bismarck, North Dakota, the first day of travel. That's 673 miles. Um, we did have some extra stops, bathroom breaks, things like that. That are including that, so we'll say 680 miles. Um, round up a little bit. So on the first day traveling to Bismarck, North Dakota, roughly 680 miles, we spent $68 at Tesla supercharging stations. So the first day traveling from home to Bismarck, North Dakota, 680 miles, we spent just shy of $68. Makes the math work out real easily. Um, so we'll round up to 68. So that's 10 cents per mile. An equivalent gasoline vehicle would likely get about 25 miles per gallon, especially at those high interstate speeds. I saw gasoline prices from $3.50 a gallon in this area in the upper Midwest, up to $4 a gallon um, into the Rocky Mountains. So we'll say equivalent uh, is $3.75 per gallon. So it's $1.25 less to go 25 miles in this versus a gasoline vehicle. Not a massive difference, um, but there, there's still a difference. It's cheaper to drive this. So if we assume that the average price of gasoline was $3.75, that would mean to get the same road trip cost 
in our Model Y to a gasoline vehicle, the gasoline vehicle or diesel vehicle would have to get 37.5 miles per gallon. And there's obviously some vehicles to do that if you took a small economy car. Uh, some of the hybrid vehicles will be able to get that and, and basically you're at a break even point. Now, there's a lot with the EPA rating that as their miles per gallon, but I seriously doubt you actually get that on the interstate. But anyway, um, that, that's a good comparison point, I think, on the road trip. Again, the electricity at the Tesla supercharger is about three times what I pay at home. So that just multiplies things in our day-to-day -day life. Um, it's significantly cheaper to use electricity in this vehicle than it is to fill up a gasoline or diesel vehicle in most of our life. And it's a little bit cheaper if you're using those par public charging stations uh, on a road trip or something like that. What I personally like about the Model Y and Tesla's electric vehicles and most electric vehicles, it's like having the power of a supercharged V8 with the economy of a hybrid. Thanks for watching. Adios.